Chapter 19, in which a notable plan is discussed and determined on. It was a chill, damp, windy night when the Jew, buttoning his great coat tight round his shriveled body and pulling the collar up over his ears, so as completely to obscure the lower part of his face, emerged from his den. He paused on the step as the door was locked and chained behind him, and having listened while the boys made all secure, and until their retreating footsteps were no longer audible, slunk down the street as quickly as he could. The house to which Oliver had been conveyed was in the neighborhood of Whitechapel, the Jew stopped for an instant at the corner of the street, and, glancing suspiciously round, crossed the road and struck off in the direction of Spitalfields. The mud lay thick upon the stones, and a black mist hung over the streets. The rain fell sluggishly down, and everything felt cold and clammy to the touch. It seemed just the night when it befitted such a being as the Jew to be abroad. As he glided stealthily along, creeping beneath the shelter of the walls and doorways, the hideous old man seemed like some loathsome reptile, engendered in the slime and darkness through which he moved, crawling forth by night in search of some rich offal for a meal. He kept on his course, through many winding and narrow ways, until he reached Bethnal Green. Then, turning suddenly off to the left, he soon became involved in a maze of the mean and dirty streets which abound in that close and densely populated quarter. The Jew was evidently too familiar with the ground he traversed to be at all bewildered, either by the darkness of the night or the intricacies of the way. He hurried through several alleys and streets, and at length turned into one, lighted only by a single lamp at the farther end. At the door of a house in the street he knocked. Having exchanged a few muttered words with the person who opened it, he walked upstairs. A dog growled as he touched the handle of a room door, and a man's voice demanded who was there. Only me, Bill, only me, my dear, said the Jew looking in. Bring in your body then, said Sykes. Lie down, you stupid brute, don't you know the devil, when he's got a great coat on? Apparently the dog had been somewhat deceived by Mr. Fagin's outer garment, for as the Jew unbuttoned it and threw it over the back of a chair, he retired to the corner from which he had risen, wagging his tail as he went, to show that he was as well satisfied as it was in his nature to be. Well, said Sykes. Well, my dear, replied the Jew. Ah, Nancy! The latter recognition was uttered with just enough of embarrassment to imply a doubt of its reception, for Mr. Fagin and his young friend had not met since she had interfered in behalf of Oliver. All doubts upon the subject, if he had any, were speedily removed by the young lady's behavior. She took her feet off the fender, pushed back her chair, and bade Fagin draw up his, without saying more about it, for it was a cold night and no mistake. It is cold, Nancy dear, said the Jew, as he warmed his skinny hands over the fire. It seems to go right through one, added the old man, touching his side. It must be a piercer if it finds its way through your heart, said Mr. Sykes. Give him something to drink, Nancy. Burn my body, make haste. It's enough to turn a man ill, to see his lean old carcass shivering in that way, like an ugly ghost just rose from the grave. Nancy quickly brought a bottle from the cupboard, in which there were many, which, to judge from the diversity of their appearance, were filled with several kinds of liquids. Sykes, pouring out a glass of brandy, bade the Jew drink it off. Quite enough, quite, thank you, Bill, replied the Jew, putting down the glass after just setting his lips to it. What? You're afraid of our getting the better of you, are you? inquired Sykes, fixing his eyes on the Jew. Ugh! With a hoarse grunt of contempt, Mr. Sykes seized the glass and threw the remainder of its contents into the ashes, as a preparatory ceremony to filling it again for himself, which he did at once. The Jew glanced around the room as his companion tossed down the second glassful, 
not in curiosity, for he had seen it often before, but in a restless and suspicious manner habitual to him. It was a meanly furnished apartment, with nothing but the contents of the closet, to induce the belief that its occupier was anything but a working man, and with no more suspicious articles displayed to view than two or three heavy bludgeons which stood in a corner, and a life-preserver that hung over the chimney-piece. There, said Sykes, smacking his lips, now I'm ready. For business, inquired the Jew. For business, replied Sykes. So say what you've got to say. About the crib at Chertsey, Bill, said the Jew, drawing his chair forward and speaking in a very low voice. Yes, what about it, inquired Sykes. Ah, you know what I mean, my dear, said the Jew. He knows what I mean, Nancy, don't he? No, he don't, sneered Mr. Sykes, or he won't, and that's the same thing. Speak out and call things by their right names. Don't sit there winking and blinking and talking to me in hints as if you weren't the very first that thought about the robbery. What do you mean? Hush, Bill, hush, said the Jew, who had in vain attempted to stop this burst of indignation. Somebody will hear us, my dear. Somebody will hear us. Let him hear, said Sykes. I don't care. But as Mr. Sykes did care, on reflection, he dropped his voice as he said the words and grew calmer. There, there, said the Jew, coaxing me. It was only my caution, nothing more. Now, my dear, about that crib at Chertsey. When is it to be done, Bill, huh? When is it to be done? Such plate, my dear, such plate, said the Jew, rubbing his hands and elevating his eyebrows in a rapture of anticipation. Not at all, replied Sykes coldly. Not to be done at all? echoed the Jew, leaning back in his chair. No, not at all, rejoined Sykes. At least it can't be a put-up job as we expected. Then it hasn't been properly gone about, said the Jew, turning pale with anger. Don't tell me. But I will tell you, retorted Sykes. Who are you that's not to be told? I tell you that Toby Crackett has been hanging about the place for a fortnight, and he can't get one of the servants in line. Do you mean to tell me, Bill, said the Jew, softening as the other grew heated, that neither of the two men in the house can be got over? Yes, I do mean to tell you so, replied Sykes. The old lady has had em these twenty years, and if you were to give em five hundred pound, they wouldn't be in it. But do you mean to say, my dear, remonstrated the Jew, that the women can't be got over? Not a bit of it, replied Sykes. Not by flash Toby Crackett, said the Jew incredulously. Think what women are, Bill. No, not even by flash Toby Crackett, replied Sykes. He said he's worn sham whiskers and a canary waistcoat the whole blessed time he's been loitering down there, and it's all of no use. He should have tried mustachios and a pair of military trousers, my dear, said the Jew. So he did, rejoined Sykes, and they weren't of no more use than the other plant. The Jew looked blank at this information. After ruminating for some minutes with his chin sunk on his breast, he raised his head and said with a deep sigh that if Flash Toby Crackett reported aright, he feared the game was up. And yet, said the old man, dropping his hands on his knees, it's a sad thing, my dear, to lose so much when we had set our hearts upon it. So it is, said Mr. Sykes, worse luck. A long silence ensued during which the Jew was plunged in deep thought, with his face wrinkled into an expression of villainy perfectly demoniacal. Sykes eyed him furtively from time to time. Nancy, apparently fearful of irritating the housebreaker, sat with her eyes fixed upon the fire, as if she had been deaf to all that passed. Figgin, said Sykes, abruptly breaking the stillness that prevailed, is it worth fifty shiners extra? If it's safely done from the outside? Yes, said the Jew, as suddenly rousing himself. Is it a bargain? inquired Sykes. Yes, my dear, yes, rejoined the Jew, his eyes glistening and every muscle in his face working with the excitement that the inquiry had awakened. Then, said Sykes, thrusting aside the Jew's hand with some disdain, let it come off as soon as you like. Toby and me, were over the garden wall the night afore last, sounding the panels of the door and shutters. The cribs barred up at night like a jail, but there's one part we can crack, safe and softly. 
which is that bill asked the jew eagerly why whispered sykes as you cross the lawn yeah said the jew bending his head forward with his eyes almost starting out of it oh cried sykes stopping short as the girl scarcely moving her head looked suddenly round and pointed for an instant to the jew's face never mind which part it is you can't do it without me i know but it's best to be on the safe side when one deals with you as you like my dear as you like replied the jew is there no help wanted but yours and toby's none said sykes except a centre bit and a boy the first we've both got the second you must find us a boy exclaimed the jew oh then it's a panel eh never mind what it is replied sykes i want a boy and he mustn't be a big un lord said mr sykes reflectively if i'd only got that young boy of ned the chimbley sweepers he kept him small on purpose and let him out by the job but the father gets lagged and then the juvenile delinquent society comes and takes the boy away from a trade where he was earning money teaches him to read and write and in time makes a prentice of him and so they go on said mr sykes his wrath rising with the recollection of his wrongs and so they go on and if they've got money enough which it's a providence they haven't we shouldn't have half a dozen boys left in the whole trade in a year or two no more we should acquiesced the jew who had been considering during this speech and had only caught the last sentence bill what now inquired sykes the jew nodded his head towards nancy who was still gazing at the fire and intimated by a sign that he would have her told to leave the room sykes shrugged his shoulders impatiently as if he thought the precaution unnecessary but complied nevertheless by requesting miss nancy to fetch him a jug of beer you don't want any beer said nancy folding her arms and retaining her seat very composedly i tell you i do replied sykes nonsense rejoined the girl coolly go on fagin i know what he's going to say bill he needn't mind me the jew still hesitated sykes looked from one to the other in some surprise why you don't mind the old girl do you fagin he asked at length you've known her long enough to trust her or the devil's in it she ain't one to blab are you nancy i should think not replied the young lady drawing her chair up to the table and putting her elbows upon it no no my dear i know you're not said the jew but and again the old man paused but what inquired sykes i didn't know whether she mightn't perhaps be out of sorts you know my dear as she was the other night replied the jew at this confession miss nancy burst into a loud laugh and swallowing a glass of brandy shook her head with an air of defiance and burst into sundry exclamations of keep the game a goin never say die and the like these seemed to have the effect of reassuring both gentlemen for the jew nodded his head with a satisfied air and resumed his seat as did mr sykes likewise now fagin said nancy with a laugh tell bill at once about oliver ha you're a clever one my dear the sharpest girl i ever saw said the jew patting her on the neck it was about oliver i was going to speak sure enough ha 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 what about him demanded sykes he's the boy for you my dear replied the jew in a hoarse whisper laying his finger on the side of his nose and grinning frightfully Heh! exclaimed sykes have him bill said nancy i would if i was in your place he mayn't be so much up as any of the others but that's not what you want and if he's only to open a door for you depend upon it he's a safe one bill i know he is rejoined fagin he's been in good training these last few weeks and it's time he began to work for his bread besides the others are all too big well he is just the size i want said mr sykes ruminating and we'll do everything you want bill my dear interposed the jew he can't help himself that is if you frighten him enough frighten him echoed sykes it'll be no sham frightening mind you if there's anything queer about him when we once get into the work in for a penny in for a pound you won't see him alive again fagin think of that before you send him mark my words said the robber poising a crowbar which he had drawn from under the bedstead 
I've thought of it all, said the Jew with energy. I've, I've had my eye upon him, my dears. Close, close. Once let him feel that he is one of us. Once fill his mind with the idea that he has been a thief and he's ours. Ours for his life. Oh, it couldn't have come about better. The old man crossed his arms upon his breast and drawing his head and shoulders into a heap, literally hugged himself for joy. Ours, said Sykes. Yours, you mean. Perhaps I do, my dear, said the Jew with a shrill chuckle. Mine, if you like, Bill. And what, said Sykes, scowling fiercely on his agreeable friend, what makes you take so much pains about one chalk-faced kid, when you know there are fifty boys snoozing about common garden every night as you might pick and choose from? Because they're of no use to me, my dear, replied the Jew, with some confusion. Not worth the taking. Their looks come victim when they get into trouble, and I lose them all. With this boy, properly managed, my dears, I could do what I couldn't with twenty of them. Besides, said the Jew, recovering his self-possession, he has us now if he could only give us leg bail again. And he must be in the same boat with us. Never mind how he came there. It's quite enough for my power over him that he was in a robbery. That's all I want. Now, how much better this is than being obliged to put the poor little boy out of the way, which would be dangerous, and we should lose by it beside. When is it to be done? asked Nancy, stopping some turbulent exclamation on the part of Mr. Sykes, expressive of the disgust with which he received Fagin's affectation of humanity. Ah, to be sure, said the Jew. When is it to be done, Bill? I planned with Toby the night after tomorrow, rejoined Sykes in a surly voice. If he heard nothing from me to the contrary. Good, said the Jew. There's no moon. No, rejoined Sykes. It's all arranged about bringing off the swag, is it? asked the Jew. Sykes nodded. And about... Oh, ah, uh, it's all planned, rejoined Sykes, interrupting him. Never mind particulars. You'd better bring the boy here tomorrow night. I shall get off the stone an hour after daybreak. Then you hold your tongue and keep the melting pot ready, and that's all you'll have to do. After some discussion, in which all three took an active part, it was decided that Nancy should repair to the Jews next evening when the night had set in, and bring Oliver away with her. Fagin craftily observing that, if he evinced any disinclination to the task, he would be more willing to accompany the girl who had so recently interfered in his behalf than anybody else. It was also solemnly arranged that poor Oliver should, for the purposes of the contemplated expedition, be unreservedly consigned to the care and custody of Mr. William Sykes, and further, that the said Sykes should deal with him as he thought fit, and should not be held responsible by the Jew for any mischance or evil that might be necessary to visit him. It being understood that, to render the compact in this respect binding, any representations made by Mr. Sykes on his return should be required to be confirmed and corroborated in all important particulars by the testimony of Flash Toby Crackett. These preliminaries adjusted, Mr. Sykes proceeded to drink brandy at a furious rate and to flourish the crowbar in an alarming manner, yelling forth at the same time most unmusical snatches of song mingled with wild execrations. At length, in a fit of professional enthusiasm, he insisted upon producing his box of housebreaking tools, which he had no sooner stumbled in with and opened for the purpose of explaining the nature and properties of the various implements it contained, and the peculiar beauties of their construction, then he fell over the box upon the floor and went to sleep where he fell. Good night, Nancy, said the Jew, muffling himself up as before. Good night. Their eyes met, and the Jew scrutinized her narrowly. There was no flinching about the girl. She was as true and earnest in the matter as Toby Crackett himself could be. The Jew again bade her good night and bestowing a sly kick upon the prostrate form of Mr. Sykes while her back was turned, roped downstairs. Always the way, muttered the Jew to himself as he turned homeward. The worst of these women is 
that a very little thing serves to call up some long-forgotten feeling, and the best of them is that it never lasts. <laughs> the man against the child for a bag of gold. Beguiling the time with these pleasant reflections, Mr. Fagin wended his way through mud and mire to his gloomy abode, where the dodger was sitting up, impatiently awaiting his return. Is Oliver abed? I want to speak to him, was his first remark as they descended the stairs. Hours ago, replied the dodger, throwing open a door. Here he is. The boy was lying fast asleep on a rude bed upon the floor, so pale with anxiety and sadness and the closeness of his prison that he looked like death. Not death as it shows in shroud and coffin, but in the guise it wears when life has just departed, when a young and gentle spirit has, but an instant, fled to heaven, and the gross air of the world has not had time to breathe upon the changing dust it hallowed. Not now, said the Jew, turning softly away. Tomorrow, tomorrow. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 Wherein Oliver is delivered over to Mr. William Sykes When Oliver awoke in the morning, he was a good deal surprised to find that a new pair of shoes, with strong, thick soles, had been placed at his bedside, and his old shoes had been removed. At first, he was pleased with the discovery, hoping that it might be the forerunner of his release, but such thoughts were quickly dispelled on his sitting down to breakfast along with the Jew, who told him, in a tone and manner which increased his alarm, that he was to be taken to the residence of Bill Sykes that night. T to just stop there, sir? asked Oliver anxiously. No, no, my dear, not to stop there, replied the Jew. We shouldn't like to lose you. Don't be afraid, Oliver. You shall come back to us again. Ha, ha, ha. We won't be so cruel as to send you away, my dear. Oh, no, no. The old man, who was stooping over the fire toasting a piece of bread, looked round as he bantered Oliver thus, and chuckled as if to show that he knew he would still be very glad to get away if he could. I suppose, said the Jew, fixing his eyes on Oliver, you want to know what you're going to bills for, eh, my dear? Oliver colored involuntarily to find that the old thief had been reading his thoughts, but boldly said, yes, he did want to know. Why do you think, inquired Fagin, burying the question. Indeed, I don't know, sir, replied Oliver. Bah, said the Jew, turning away with a disappointing countenance from a close perusal of the boy's face. Wait till Bill tells you then. The Jew seemed much vexed by Oliver's not expressing any greater curiosity on the subject. But the truth is that although Oliver felt very anxious, he was much too confused by the earnest cunning of Fagin's looks and his own speculations to make any further inquiries just then. He had no other opportunity, for the Jew remained very surly and silent till night, when he prepared to go abroad. He may burn one candle, said the Jew, putting one upon the table, and here's a book for you to read till they come to fetch you. Good night. Good night, replied Oliver softly. The Jew walked to the door, looking over his shoulder at the boy as he went. Suddenly stopping, he called him by his name. Oliver looked up. The Jew, pointing to the candle, motioned him to light it. He did so, and as he placed the candlestick upon the table, he saw that the Jew was gazing fixedly at him, with lowering and contracted brows, from the dark end of the room. Take heed, Oliver, take heed, said the old man, shaking his right hand before him in a warning manner. He's a rough man. He thinks nothing of blood when his own is up. Whatever falls out, say nothing, and do what he bids you. Mind. Placing a strong emphasis on the last word, he suffered his features to gradually resolve themselves into a ghastly grin, and nodding his head, he left the room. Oliver leaned his head upon his hand when the old man disappeared and pondered with a trembling heart on the words he had just heard. The more he thought of the Jew's admonition, the more he was at a loss to divine its real purpose and meaning. He could think of no bad object to be attained by sending him to Sykes, which would not be equally well answered by his remaining with Fagin, and after mediating for a long time, concluded that he had been selected to perform some ordinary menial offices for the housebreaker, 
until another boy, better suited for his purpose, could be engaged. He was too well accustomed to suffering, and had suffered too much where he was to bewail the prospect of change very severely. He remained lost in thought for some minutes, and then with a heavy sigh, snuffed the candle, and taking the book up which the Jew had left him, began to read. He turned over the leaves, carelessly at first, but lighting on a passage which attracted his attention. He soon became intent upon the volume. It was a history of the lives and trials of great criminals, and the pages were soiled and thumbed with use. Here he read the dreadful crimes that had made blood red cold, of secret murders that had been committed by the lonely wayside, of bodies hidden from the eye of man in deep pits and wells, which would not keep them down, deep as they were, but had yielded them up at last after many years, and so matted the murderers with the sight, that in their horror they had confessed their guilt, and yelled for the gibbet to end their agony. Here, too, he read, of men who, lying in their beds at the dead of night, had been tempted, so they said, and led on by their own bad thoughts, to such dreadful bloodshed as it made the flesh creep and the limbs quell to think of. The terrible descriptions were so real and vivid that the sallow pages seemed to turn red with gore, and the words upon them to be sounded in his ears, as if they were whispered in hollow murmurs by the spirits of the dead. In a paroxysm of fear, the boy closed the book and thrust it from him, and falling upon his knees, he prayed heaven to spare him from such deeds, and rather to will that he should die at once than be reserved for such crimes, so fearful and appalling. By degrees he grew more calm and besought, in a low and broken voice, that he might be rescued from his present dangers, and that if any aid were to be raised up for a poor outcast boy, who had never known the love of friends of, or kindred, it might come to him now, when, desolate and deserted, he stood alone in the midst of wickedness and guilt. He had concluded his prayer, but still remained with his head buried in his hands, when a rustling noise aroused him. "'What's that?' he cried, starting up, and catching a sight of a figure standing by the door. "'Who's there?' "'Me, only me,' replied a tremulous voice. Oliver raised the candle above his head and looked towards the door. It was Nancy. Put down the light, the girl said, turning away her head. It hurts my eyes. Oliver saw that she was very pale, and gently inquired if she were ill. The girl threw herself into a chair, with her back towards him, and wrung her hands, but made no reply. God forgive me, she cried after a while. I never thought of this. Has anything happened, asked Oliver. Can I help you? I will if I can. I will, indeed. She rocked herself to and fro, caught her throat, and uttering a girly sound, gasped for breath. Nancy, cried Oliver, what is it? The girl beat her hands upon her knees, and, suddenly stopping, drew her shawl close around her, and shivered with the cold. Oliver stirred the fire. Drawing her chair close to it, she sat there for a little time without speaking, but at length she raised her head and looked round. I don't know what comes over me sometimes, said she, affecting to busy herself in arranging her dress. It's this damp, dirty room, I think. Now, Nolly, dear, are you ready? Am I to go with you? asked Oliver. Yes, I have come from Bill, replied the girl. You are to come with me. What for? asked Oliver, recoiling. What for? echoed the girl, raising her eyes and averting them again, for the moment they encountered the boy's face. Oh, for no arm. I don't believe it, said Oliver, who had watched her closely. Have it your own way, rejoined the girl, affecting to laugh. For no good, then. Oliver could see that he had some power over the girl's better feelings, and for an instant thought of appealing to her compassion for his helpless state. But then the thought darted across his mind that it was a barely eleven o'clock, and that many people were still in the streets, of whom some surely might be found to give credence to his tale. As the reflection occurred to him, he stepped forward and said somewhat hastily that he was ready. Neither his brief consideration nor its purport was lost on his companion. She eyed him narrowly while he spoke, and cast upon him a look of intelligence which sufficiently showed that he guessed what he had been passing in his thoughts. 
Hush, said the girl, stooping over him, and pointing to the door as she looked cautiously round. You can't help yourself. I have tried hard for you, but all to no purpose. You are hedged round and round. If you are ever able to get loose from here, this is not the time. Struck by the energy of her manner, Oliver looked up in her face with great surprise. She seemed to speak the truth. Her countenance was white and agitated, and she trembled with very earnestness. I have saved you from being ill-used once, and I will again, and I do now, continued the girl aloud, for those who would have fetched you, if I had not, would have been more far rough than me. I have promised for you being quiet and silent. If you are not, you only do harm to yourself and me too, and perhaps be my death. See here, I have borne all this for you already, as true as God sees me show it. She pointed hastily to some livid bruises on her neck and arms, and continued with great rapidity. Remember this, and don't let me suffer more for you just now. If I could help you, I would, but I have not the power. They don't mean to harm you, whatever they make you do. It is no fault of yours. Hush! Every word for me was a blow for me. Give me your hands. Make haste to your hand. She caught the hand which Oliver instinctively placed in hers, and blowing out the light, drew him after her up the stairs. The door was opened quickly and by some one shrouded in the darkness, and as quickly closed when they had passed out. A hackney cabriolet was waiting with the same vehemence which she had exhibited in dressing Oliver. The girl pulled him up with her and drew the curtains close. The driver wanted no directions but lashed out his horse into full speed without the delay of an instant. The girl still had Oliver fast by the hand and continued to pour into his ear the warnings and assurances she had already imparted. All was so quick and hurried that he had scarcely time to recollect where he was or how he came there when the carriage stopped at the house to which the Jews' stepped had been directed on the previous evening. For one brief moment, Oliver cast a hurried glance along the empty street and a cry for help hung upon his lips. But the girl's voice was in his ear, beseeching him in such tones of agony to remember her, that he had not the heart to utter it. While he hesitated, the opportunity was gone. He was already in the house, and the door was shut. This way, said the girl, releasing her hold for the first time. Bill! Hello, replied Sykes, appearing at the end of the stairs with a candle. Oh, that's the time of day. Come on. There was a very strong expression of approbation, an uncommonly hearty welcome from a person of Mr. Sykes' temperament. Nancy, appearing much gratified thereby, saluted him cordially. Bullseye gone home with Tom, observed Sykes, as he lighted them up. He'd have been in the way. That's right, rejoined Nancy. So you've got the kid, said Sykes, when they had all reached the room, closing the door as he spoke. Yes, here he is replied Nancy. Did he come quiet? inquired Sykes. Like a lamb, rejoined Nancy. I'm glad to hear it, said Sykes, looking grimly at Oliver, for the sake of his young carcass, as would otherwise have suffered for it. Come here, young one, and let me read you a lecture, which is as well got over at once. Thus addressing his new pupil, Mr. Sykes pulled off Oliver's cap, threw it in the corner, and then, taking him by the shoulder, sat himself down by the table, and stood the boy in front of him. Now first, do you know what this is? inquired Sykes, taking up a pocket pistol which lay on the table. Oliver replied in the affirmative. Well then, look here, continued Sykes. This is powder. That here's a bullet. And this is a little bit of old hat for a wadden. Oliver murmured his comprehension of the different bodies referred to, and Mr. Sykes proceeded to load the pistol with great necessity and deliberation. Now it's loaded, said Mr. Sykes, when he had finished. Yes, I see it is, sir, replied Oliver. Well, said the robber, grasping Oliver's wrist, and putting the barrel so close to his temple that they touched, at which moment the boy could not repress a start. If you speak a word when you're out of doors with me, except when I speak to you, that loading will be in your head without notice. So if you do make... You up your mind to speak without leave. Say your prayers first. Having bestowed a scowl upon the object of this warning, to increase its effect, Mr. Sykes continued, As near as I know, there isn't anybody as would be asking very particular after you. 
if you was disposed of, so I needn't take this devil and all trouble of explain matters to you, if it wasn't for your own good. Do you hear me? The short and the long of what you mean, said Nancy, speaking very empathetically, and slightly frowning at Oliver as if to bespeak his serious attention to her words, is that if you're crossed by him in this job you have on hand, you'll prevent his ever telling tales afterward by shooting him through the head, and will take your chance of swinging for it, as you do for a great many other things in the way of business, every month of your life. That's it, observed Mr. Spikes, approvingly. Women can always put things in fewest words, except when it's blowing up, and then they lengthen it out. And now that he's thoroughly up to it, let's have some supper and get a snooze before starting. In pursuance of this request, Nancy quickly laid the cloth, disappearing for a few minutes. She presently returned with a pot of porter and a dish of sheep's heads, which gave occasion to several pleasant witticisms on the part of Mr. Sykes, founded upon the singular coincidence of Jemmy's being a canned name common to them, and also to an ingenious implement much used in his profession. Indeed, the worthy gentleman, stimulated perhaps by the immediate prospect of being on active service, was in great spirits and good humor, in proof whereof it may be here remarked that he humorously drank all the beer at a draught, and did not utter on a rough calculation more than fourscore oaths during the whole progress of the meal. Supper being ended, it may be easily conceived that Oliver had no great appetite for it. Mr. Sykes disposed of a couple of glasses of spirits and water, and threw himself upon the bed, ordering Nancy, with many imprecations in case of failure, to call him at five precisely. Oliver stretched himself in his clothes by a command of the same authority, on a mattress upon the floor, and the girl, mending the fire, sat before it in readiness to rouse them at the appointed time. For a long time Oliver lay awake, thinking it not impossible that Nancy might seek the opportunity of whispering some further advice. But the girl sat brooding over the fire without moving, save now and then to trim the light. Weary with watching and anxiety, he at length fell asleep. When he awoke, the table was covered with tea things, and Sykes was thrusting various articles into the pockets of his great coat, which hung over the back of the chair. Nancy was busily engaged in preparing breakfast. It was not yet daylight, for the candle was still burning, and it was quite dark outside. A sharp rain, too, was beating against the window panes, and the sky looked black and cloudy. Now then, growled Sykes, as Oliver started up, half past five, look sharp or you'll get no breakfast, for it's late as it is. Oliver was not long in making his toilet. Having taken some breakfast, he replied to a surly inquiry from Sykes by saying that he was quite ready. Nancy, scarcely looking at the boy, threw him a handkerchief to tie round his throat. Sykes gave him a large rough cape to button over his shoulders. Thus attired, he gave his hand to the robber, who, merely pausing to show him with a menacing gesture, he had the same pistol in the side pocket of his great coat, clasped it firmly in his, and exchanging a farewell with Nancy, led him away. Oliver turned, for an instant, when they reached the door, in the hope of meeting a look from the girl. She had resumed her old seat in front of the fire, and sat perfectly motionless before it, End of chapter 20. Chapter 21. The Expedition. It was a cheerless morning when they got into the street, blowing and raining hard, and the clouds looking dull and stormy. The night had been very wet. Large pools of water had collected in the road, and the kennels were overflowing. There was a faint glimmering of the coming day in the sky, but it rather aggravated than relieved the gloom of the scene the sombre light only serving to pale that which the street lamps afforded, without shedding any warmer or brighter tints upon the wet house-tops and dreary streets. There appeared to be nobody stirring in that quarter of the town. The windows of the houses were all closely shut, and the streets through which they passed were noiseless and empty. By the time they had turned into the Bethnal Green Road, the day had fairly begun to break. Many of the lamps were already extinguished. A few country wagons were slowly toiling on towards London. Now and then a stagecoach covered with mud rattled briskly by, the driver bestowing as he passed an admonitory lash upon the heavy wagoner, who by keeping on the wrong side of the road had endangered his arriving at the office a quarter of a minute after his time. 
The public houses with gas lights burning inside were already open. By degrees, other shops began to be unclosed, and a few scattered people were met with. Then came straggling groups of laborers going to their work. Then men and women with fish baskets on their heads, donkey carts laden with vegetables, chaise carts filled with livestock or whole carcasses of meat, milk women with pails, an unbroken concourse of people trudging out with various supplies to the eastern suburbs of the town. As they approached the city, the noise and traffic gradually increased. When they threaded the streets between Shoreditch and Smithfield, it had swelled into a roar of sound and bustle. It was as light as it was likely to be, till night came on again, and the busy morning of half the London population had begun. Turning down Sun Street and Crown Street and crossing Finsbury Square, Mr. Sykes struck, by way of Chiswell Street, into Barbican, thence into Long Lane, and so into Smithfield, from which latter place arose a tumult of discordant sounds that filled Oliver Twist with amazement. It was market morning. The ground was covered, nearly ankle-deep, with filth and mire, a thick steam perpetually rising from the reeking bodies of the cattle, and mingling with the fog, which seemed to rest upon the chimney-tops, hung heavily above. All the pens in the centre of the large area, and as many temporary pens as could be crowded into the vacant space, were filled with sheep. Tied up to posts by the gutter-side were long lines of beasts and oxen, three or four deep. Countrymen, butchers, drovers, hawkers, boys, thieves, idlers, and vagabonds of every low grade were mingled together in a mass. The whistling of drovers, the barking dogs, the bellowing and plunging of the oxen, the bleeding of sheep, the grunting and squeaking of pigs, the cries of hawkers, the shouts, oaths, and quarreling on all sides, the ringing of bells and roar of voices that issued from every public house, the crowding, pushing, driving, beating, whooping, and yelling— the hideous and discordant dim that resounded from every corner of the market, and the unwashed, unshaven, squalid, and dirty figures constantly running to and fro, and bursting in and out of the throng, rendered it a stunning and bewildering scene, which quite confounded the senses. Mr. Sykes, dragging Oliver after him, elbowed his way through the thickest of the crowd, and bestowed very little attention on the numerous sights and sounds, which so astonished the boy. He nodded twice or thrice to a passing friend, and, resisting as many invitations to take a morning dram, pressed steadily onward, until they were clear of the turmoil, and had made their way through Hosier Lane into Holborn. "'Now, young un,' said Sykes, looking up at the clock of St. Andrew's Church, "'hard upon seven. You must step out. Come, don't lag behind already, lazy legs.' Mr. Sykes accompanied this speech with a jerk at his little companion's wrist. Oliver, quickening his pace into a kind of trot between a fast walk and a run, kept up with the rapid strides of the housebreaker as well as he could. They held their course at this rate until they had passed Hyde Park Corner, and were on their way to Kensington, when Sykes relaxed his pace until an empty cart which was at some little distance behind came up. Seeing Hounslow written on it, he asked the driver with as much civility as he could assume if he would give them a lift as far as Isleworth. "'Jump up,' said the man. "'Is that your boy?' "'Yes, he's my boy,' replied Sykes, looking hard at Oliver and putting his hand abstractedly into the pocket where the pistol was. "'Your father walks rather too quick for you, don't he, my man?' inquired the driver, seeing that Oliver was out of breath. "'Not a bit of it,' replied Sykes, interposing. "'He's used to it. Here, take hold of my hand, Ned. In with you.' Thus addressing Oliver, he helped him into the cart, and the driver, pointing to a heap of sacks, told him to lie down there and rest himself. As they passed the different milestones, Oliver wondered, more and more, where his companion meant to take him. Kensington, Hammersmith, Chiswick, Kewbridge, Brentford were all passed, and yet they went on as steadily as if they had only just begun their journey. At length they came to a public house called the Coach and Horses, a little way beyond which another road appeared to run off. And here the cart stopped. Sykes dismounted with great precipitation, holding Oliver by the hand all the while, and lifting him down directly, bestowed a furious look upon him, and wrapped the side pocket with his fist in a significant manner. "'Good-bye, boy,' said the man. "'He's sulky,' replied Sykes, giving him a shake. "'He's sulky, a young dog. Don't mind him.' "'Not I,' rejoined the other, getting into his cart. "'It's a fine day, after all.' And he drove away. Sykes waited until he had fairly gone, and then telling Oliver he might look about him if he wanted— once again led him onward on his journey. They turned round to the left a short way past the public house, and then, taking a right-hand road, walked on for a long time, passing many large gardens and gentlemen's houses on both sides of the way, and stopping for nothing but a little beer until they reached a town. 
Here against the wall of a house, Oliver saw, written up in pretty large letters, Hampton. They lingered about in the fields for some hours. At length they came back into the town, and turning into an old public house with a defaced signboard, ordered some dinner by the kitchen fire. The kitchen was an old, low-roofed room with a great beam across the middle of the ceiling and benches with high backs to them by the fire, on which were seated several rough men in smock-frocks drinking and smoking. They took no notice of Oliver, and very little of Sykes, and, as Sykes took very little notice of them, he and his young comrade sat in a corner by themselves without being much troubled by their company. They had some cold meat for dinner, and sat so long after it while Mr. Sykes indulged himself with three or four pipes that Oliver began to feel quite certain they were not going any further. Being much tired with the walk and getting up so early, he dozed a little at first, then, quite overpowered by fatigue and the fumes of the tobacco, fell asleep. It was quite dark when he was awakened by a push from Sykes. Rousing himself sufficiently to sit up and look about him, he found that worthy in close fellowship and communication with a laboring man over a pint of ale. "'So you're going on to Lower Halliford, are you?' inquired Sykes. "'Yes, I am,' replied the man, who seemed a little the worse, or better, as the case might be, for drinking. "'And not slow about it, neither. My horse hasn't got a load behind him going back, as he had coming up in the morning, and he won't be long a doing of it. Here's luck to him.' "'Eh, God, he's a good um. "'Could you give my boy and me a lift as far as there?' demanded Sykes, pushing the ale towards his new friend. "'If you're going directly, I can,' replied the man, looking out of the pot. "'Are you going to Oliford?' "'Going on to Shepperton,' replied Sykes. "'I'm your man as far as I go,' replied the other. "'Is all paid, Becky?' "'Yes, the other gentleman's paid,' replied the girl. "'I say,' said the man, with tipsy gravity, "'that won't do, you know.' "'Why not?' rejoined Sykes. "'You are going to accommodate us, and what's to prevent my standing treat for a pint or so in return?' The stranger reflected upon this argument with a very profound face. Having done so, he seized Sykes by the hand and declared he was a real good fellow, to which Mr. Sykes replied he was joking, as, if he had been sober, there would have been strong reason to suppose he was. After the exchange of a few more compliments, they bade the company good night and went out, the girl gathering up the pots and glasses as they did so, and lounging out to the door with her hands full to see the party start. The horse, whose health had been drunk in his absence, was standing outside, ready harnessed to the cart. Oliver and Sykes got in without any further ceremony, and the man to whom he belonged, having lingered for a minute or two to bear him up, and to defy the hostler in the world to produce his equal, mounted also. Then the hostler was told to give the horse his head, and his head being given him, he made a very unpleasant use of it, tossing it into the air with great disdain and running into the parlor windows over the way. After performing those feats and supporting himself for a short time on his hind legs, he started off at great speed and rattled out of the town right gallantly. The night was very dark. A damp mist rose from the river, and the marshy ground about, and spread itself over the dreary fields. It was piercing cold, too. All was gloomy and black. Not a word was spoken, for the driver had grown sleepy, and Sykes was in no mood to lead him into conversation. Oliver sat huddled together in a corner of the cart, bewildered with alarm and apprehension, and figuring strange objects in the gaunt trees, whose branches waved grimly to and fro, as if in some fantastic joy at the desolation of the scene. As they passed Sunbury Church, the clock struck seven. There was a light in the ferry house window opposite, which streamed across the road and threw into more somber shadow a dark yew tree with graves beneath it. There was a dull sound of falling water not far off, and the leaves of the old tree stirred gently in the night wind. It seemed like quiet music for the repose of the dead. Sunbury was passed through, and they came again into the lonely road. Two or three miles more, and the cart stopped. Sykes alighted, took Oliver by the hand, and they once again walked on. They turned into no house at Shepperton, as the weary boy had expected, but still kept walking on, in mud and darkness, through gloomy lanes and over cold open wastes, until they came within sight of the lights of a town at no great distance. On looking intently forward, Oliver saw that the water was just below them, and that they were coming to the foot of a bridge. Sykes kept straight on until they were close upon the bridge, then turned suddenly down a bank upon the left. The water, thought Oliver, turning sick with fear. He has brought me to this lonely place to murder me. He was about to throw himself on the ground and make one struggle for his young life when he saw that they stood before a solitary house, all ruinous and decayed, 
There was a window on each side of the dilapidated entrance, and one story above, but no light was visible. The house was dark, dismantled, and by all appearance, uninhabited. Sykes, with Oliver's hand still in his, softly approached the low porch and raised the latch. The door yielded to the pressure, and they passed in together. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 The Burglary Hello, cried a loud hoarse voice, as soon as they set foot in the passage. Don't make such a row, said Sykes, bolting the door. Show a glim, Toby. Aha, my pal, cried the same voice. A glim, Barney, a glim. Show the gentleman in, Barney. Wake up first, if convenient. The speaker appeared to throw a boot jack, or some such article, at the person he addressed, to rouse him from his slumbers. For the noise of a wooden body falling violently was heard, and then an indistinct muttering, as of a man between sleep and awake. Do you hear, cried the same voice? There's Bill Sykes in the passage, with nobody to do the civil to him. And you sleeping there as if you took laudanum with your meals, and nothing stronger. Are you any fresher now? Or do you want the iron candlestick to wake you thoroughly? A pair of slipshod feet shuffled hastily across the bare floor of the room, as this interrogatory was put, and there issued from a door on the right hand first a feeble candle, and next the form of the same individual who had been heretofore described as laboring under the infirmity of speaking through his nose, and officiating as a waiter at the public house on Saffron Hill. "'Mr. Sykes!' exclaimed Barney, with real or counterfeit joy. "'Cabid, sir! Cabid!' "'Here, you get on first, said Sykes, putting Oliver in front of him. "'Quicker, or I shall tread upon your heels.' Muttering a curse upon his tardiness, Sykes pushed Oliver before him, and they entered a low, dark room with a smoky fire, two or three broken chairs, a table, and a very old couch, on which, with his legs much higher than his head, a man was reposing at full length, smoking a long clay pipe. He was dressed in a smartly cut, snuff-colored coat with large brass buttons, an orange neckerchief, a coarse, staring, shawl-patterned waistcoat, and drab breeches. Mr. Crackett, for he it was, had no very great quantity of hair, either upon his head or face, but what he had was of a reddish dye, and tortured into long corkscrew curls, through which he occasionally thrust some very dirty fingers, ornamented with large common rings. He was a trifle above the middle size, and apparently rather weak in the legs, but this circumstance by no means detracted from his own admiration of his top boots, which he contemplated in their elevated situation with lively satisfaction. "'Bill, my boy,' said this figure, turning his head towards the door, "'I'm glad to see you. I was almost afraid you'd given it up, in which case I should have made a personal winter. Hello!' Uttering this exclamation in a tone of great surprise, as his eyes rested on Oliver, Mr. Toby Crackett brought himself into a sitting posture and demanded who that was. "'The boy, only the boy,' replied Sykes, drawing a chair towards the fire. "'What of Mr. Fagin's lads?' exclaimed Barney with a grin. "'Fagin's, eh?' exclaimed Toby, looking at Oliver. "'What an inwallable boy that'll make, for the old lady's pockets and chapels. His mug is a fortin' to him.' "'There, there's enough of that,' interposed Sykes impatiently, and stooping over his recumbent friend, he whispered a few words in his ear, at which Mr. Crackett laughed immensely and honored Oliver with a long stare of astonishment. Now, said Sykes, as he resumed his seat, if you'll give us something to eat and drink while we're waiting, you'll put some heart in us, or in me at all events. Sit down by the fire, Yonker, and rest yourself, for you'll have to go out with us again tonight, though not very far off. Oliver looked at Sykes in mute and timid wonder, and drawing a stool to the fire, sat with his aching head upon his hands scarcely knowing where he was or what was passing around him. Here, said Toby, as the young Jew placed some fragments of food and a bottle upon the table. Success to the crack, he rose to honor the toast, and carefully depositing his empty pipe in a corner, advanced to the table, filled a glass with spirits, and drank off its contents. Mr. Sykes did the same. A drain for the boy, said Toby, half filling a wine glass. Down with it, innocence. Indeed, said Oliver, looking piteously up into the man's face. Indeed, I... Down with it, echoed Toby. Do you think I don't know what's good for you? Tell him to drink it, Bill. He had better, said Sykes, clapping his hand upon his pocket. Burn my body if he isn't in more trouble than a whole family of dodgers. 
Drink it, you perverse imp. Drink it. Frightened by the menacing gestures of the two men, Oliver hastily swallowed the contents of the glass and immediately fell into a violent fit of coughing, which delighted Toby Crackett and Barney, and even drew a smile from the surly Mr. Sykes. This done, and Sykes having satisfied his appetite, Oliver could eat nothing but a small crust of bread which they made him swallow, the two men laid themselves down on chairs for a short nap. Oliver retained his stool by the fire. Barney, wrapped in a blanket, stretched himself on the floor, close outside the fender. They slept, or appeared to sleep, for some time, nobody stirring but Barney, who rose once or twice to throw coals on the fire. Oliver fell into a heavy doze, imagining himself straying along the gloomy lanes, or wandering about the dark churchyard, or retracing some one or other of the scenes of the past day, when he was roused by Toby Crackett jumping up and declaring that it was half-past one. In an instant, the other two were on their legs, and all were actively engaged in busy preparation. Sykes and his companion enveloped their necks and chins in large, dark shawls, and drew on their greatcoats. Barney, opening a cupboard, brought forth several articles, which he hastily crammed into the pockets. Barkers for me, Barney, said Toby Crackett. Here they are, replied Barney, producing a pair of pistols. You loaded them yourself. All right, replied Toby, stowing them away. The persuaders? I've got them, replied Sykes. Crepe, keys, center bits, darkies, nothing forgotten, inquired Toby, fastening a small crowbar to a loop inside the skirt of his coat. All right, rejoined his companion. Bring them bits of timber, Barney. That's the time of day. With these words, he took a thick stick from Barney's hands, who, having delivered another to Toby, busied himself in fastening on Oliver's cape. Now then, said Sykes, holding out his hand. Oliver, who was completely stupefied by the unwanted exercise and the air and the drink which had been forced upon him, put his hand mechanically into that which Sykes extended for the purpose. Take his other hand, Toby, said Sykes. Look out, Barney. The man went to the door and returned to announce that all was quiet. The two robbers issued forth with Oliver between them. Barney, having made all fast, rolled himself up as before, and was soon asleep again. It was now intensely dark. The fog was much heavier than it had been in the early part of the night, and the atmosphere was so damp that although no rain fell, Oliver's hair and eyebrows, within a few minutes after leaving the house, had become stiff with the half-frozen moisture that was floating about. They crossed the bridge and kept on towards the lights, which he had seen before. They were at no great distance off, and as they walked pretty briskly, they soon arrived at Chertsey. Slap through the town, whispered Sykes. There will be nobody in the way tonight to see us. Toby acquiesced, and they hurried through the main street of the little town, which at that late hour was wholly deserted. A dim light shone at intervals from some bedroom, and the hoarse barking of dogs occasionally broke the silence of the night but there was nobody abroad. They had cleared the town as the church bell struck two. Quickening their pace, they turned up a road upon the left hand. After walking about a quarter of a mile, they stopped before a detached house, surrounded by a wall, to the top of which Toby Crackett, scarcely pausing to take breath, climbed in a twinkling. The boy next, said Toby. Hoist him up. I'll catch hold of him. Before Oliver had time to look around, Sykes had caught him under the arms, and in three or four seconds he and Toby were lying on the grass on the other side. Sykes followed directly, and they stole cautiously towards the house. And now, for the first time, Oliver, well nigh mad with grief and terror, saw that housebreaking and robbery, if not murder, were the objects of the expedition. He clasped his hands together and involuntarily uttered a subdued exclamation of horror. A mist came before his eyes. The cold sweat stood upon his ashy face, his limbs failed him, and he sank upon his knees. Get up, murmured Sykes, trembling with rage and drawing the pistol from his pocket. Get up or I'll strew your brains upon the grass. Oh, for God's sake, let me go, cried Oliver. Let me run away and die in the fields. I will never come near London, never, never. Oh, pray have mercy on me, and do not make me steal. For the love of all the bright angels that rest in heaven, have mercy upon me. The man to whom this appeal was made swore a dreadful oath and had cocked the pistol when Toby, striking it from his grasp, placed his hands upon the boy's mouth and dragged him to the house. 
Hush, cried the man. It won't answer here. Say another word and I'll do your business myself with a crack on the head. That makes no noise and is quite as certain and more genteel. Here, Bill, wrench the shutter open. He's game enough now, I'll engage. I've seen older hands of his age took the same way for a minute or two on a cold night. Sykes, invoking terrific imprecations upon Fagin's head for sending Oliver on such an errand, plied the crowbar vigorously, but with little noise. After some delay, and some assistance from Toby, the shutter to which he had referred swung open on its hinges. It was a little lattice window, about five feet and a half above the ground at the back of the house, which belonged to a scullery, or small brewing place, at the end of the passage. The aperture was so small that the inmates had probably not thought it worth while to defend it more securely, but it was large enough to admit a boy of Oliver's size nevertheless. A very brief exercise of Mr. Sykes' art sufficed to overcome the fastening of the lattice, and it soon stood wide open also. Now listen, you young limb, whispered Sykes, drawing a dark lantern from his pocket and throwing the glare full on Oliver's face. I'm a-going to put you through there. Take this light, go softly up the steps straight afore you, and along the little hall to the street door, unfasten it, and let us in. There's a bolt at the top you won't be able to reach, interposed Toby. Stand upon one of the hall chairs. There are three there, Bill, with a jolly large blue unicorn and gold pitchfork on them, which is the old lady's arms. Keep quiet, can't you? replied Sykes with a threatening look. The room door is open, is it? Wide, replied Toby, after peeping in to satisfy himself. The game of that is that they always leave it open with a catch, so that the dog, who's got a bed in here, may walk up and down the passage when he feels wakeful. Ha! Ha! Barney tossed him away tonight. So neat. Although Mr. Crackett spoke in a scarcely audible whisper and laughed without noise, Sykes imperiously commanded him to be silent and to get to work. Toby complied by first producing his lantern and placing it on the ground, then by planting himself firmly with his head against the wall beneath the window and his hands upon his knees so as to make a step of his back. This was no sooner done than Sykes, mounting upon him, put Oliver gently through the window with his feet first, and without leaving hold of his collar, planted him safely on the floor inside. Take this lantern, said Sykes, looking into the room. You see the stairs before you? Oliver, more dead than alive, gasped out, Yes. Sykes, pointing to the street door with the pistol barrel, briefly advised him to take notice that he was within shot all the way, and that if he faltered, he would fall dead that instant. It's done in a minute, said Sykes, in the same low whisper. Directly I leave go of you, do your work. Hark! What's that? whispered the other man. They listened intently. Nothing, said Sykes, releasing his hold of Oliver. Now! In the short time he had to collect his senses, the boy had firmly resolved that whether he died in the attempt or not, he would make one effort to dart upstairs from the hall and alarm the family. Filled with this idea, he advanced at once, but stealthily. Come back! suddenly cried Sykes aloud. Back! Back! Scared by the sudden breaking of the dead stillness of the place, and by a loud cry which followed it, Oliver let his lantern fall, and knew not whether to advance or fly. The cry was repeated. A light appeared. A vision of two terrified half-dressed men at the top of the stairs swam before his eyes. A flash! A loud noise! A smoke! A crash somewhere! But where he knew not! And he staggered back. Sykes had disappeared for an instant, but he was up again, and had him by the collar before the smoke had cleared away. He fired his own pistol after the men, who were already retreating, and dragged the boy up. "'Clasp your arm tighter,' said Sykes, as he drew him through the window. "'Give me a shawl here. They've hit him. Quick! How the boy bleeds!' Then came the loud ringing of a bell, mingled with the noise of firearms and the shouts of men, and the sensation of being carried over uneven ground at a rapid pace. And then the noises grew confused in the distance, and a cold, deadly feeling crept over the boy's heart and he saw or heard no more. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 Which contains the substance of a pleasant conversation between Mr. Bumble and the lady, and shows that even a beetle may be susceptible on some points. The night was bitter cold. The snow lay on the ground, frozen into a hard, thick crust, 
so that only the heaps that had drifted into byways and corners were affected by the sharp wind that howled abroad, which, as if expending increased fury on such prey as it found, caught it savagely up in clouds, and whirling into a thousand misty eddies, scattered it in air. Bleak, dark, and piercing cold, it was a night for the well-housed and fed to draw around the bright fire and thank God they were at home, and for the homeless, starving wretch to lay him down and die. Many a hunger-worn outcast closed their eyes on our bare streets, at such times who, let their crimes have been what they may, can hardly open them in a more bitter world. Such was the aspect of out of doors affairs, when Mrs. Corney, the matron of the workhouse, to which our readers have been already introduced as the birthplace of Oliver Twist, sat herself down before a cheerful fire in her own little room and glanced, with no small degree of complacency, at a small round table on which stood a tray of corresponding size, furnished with all necessary materials for a most grateful meal the matrons enjoy. In fact, Mrs. Corney was about to solace herself with a cup of tea, as she glanced from the table to the fireplace, where the smallest of all possible kettles was singing a small song in a small voice, her inward satisfaction evidently increased, so much so, indeed, that Mrs. Corney smiled. Well, said the matron, leaning her elbow on the table and looking reflectively at the fire, I'm sure we have all on us a great deal to be thankful for. A great deal if we know it. Ah! Mrs. Corney shook her head mournfully, as if deploring the mental blindness of those paupers who did not know it, and thrusting a silver spoon, private property, in the innermost recesses of a two-ounce tin tea caddy, proceeded to make the tea. How slight of a thing will disturb the equanimity of our frail minds, the black teapot being very small and easily filled, ran over while Mrs. Corney was moralizing, and the water slightly scalded Mrs. Corney's hand. Drat the pot! said the worthy matron, setting it down very hastily on the hob. A little stupid thing that only holds a couple of cups. What good is it up to anybody except Mrs. Corney, pausing, except a poor, desolate creature like me? Oh, dear. With these words, the matron dropped into a chair and, once more resting her elbow on the table, thought of her solitary fate. The small teapot and the single cup had awakened in a sad mind recollections of Mr. Corney, who had not been dead more than five and twenty years, and she was overpowered. "'I shall never get another,' said Mrs. Corney pettishly. "'I shall never get another, like him.' Whether this remark bore a reference to the husband or the teapot is uncertain. It might have been the latter, for Mrs. Corney looked at it as she spoke and took it up afterwards. She had just tasted her first cup when she was disturbed by a soft tap at the room door. "'Oh, come with you,' said Mrs. Corney sharply. "'Some of the old women dying, I suppose. "'They always die when I'm at meals.' Don't stand there letting the cold air in. What's amiss now, eh? Nothing, ma'am, nothing, replied a man's voice. But dear me, exclaimed the matron, in a much sweeter tone. Is that Mr. Bumble? At your service, ma'am, said Mr. Bumble, who had been stopping outside to rub his shoes clean and to shake the snow off his coat, and who now made his appearance bearing the cocked hat in one hand and a bundle in the other. Shall I shut the door, ma'am? The lady modestly hesitated to reply lest there should be any impropriety in holding an interview with Mr. Bumble with closed doors. Mr. Bumble, taking advantage of the hesitation, and being very cold himself, shut it without permission. "'Hard weather, Mr. Bumble,' said the matron. "'Hard indeed, ma'am,' replied the beetle. "'Aren't it broke your weather this, ma'am? We have given away, Mrs. Courtney, we have given away a matter of twenty quartern loaves and a cheese and a half this very blessed afternoon, yet them paupers were not contented.' "'Of course not.' "'When would they be, Mr. Bumble?' said the matron, sipping her tea. "'When indeed, ma'am,' rejoined Mr. Bumble. "'Why, there's one man, in consideration of his wife and large family, "'has a quarter and loaf and a good pound of cheese, full weight. "'Is he grateful, ma'am? "'Is he grateful? Not a copper farthing's worth of it. "'What does he do, ma'am, but ask for a few coals? "'It's only a pocket handkerchief full, he says, coals. "'What does he do with coals, toast his cheese with them, and come back for more?' "'That's the way with these people, ma'am. "'Give them an apron full of coals today, "'and they'll come back for another the day after tomorrow's "'brazen as alabaster.' "'The matron expressed her entire concurrence "'with this intelligible simile, and the beetle went on. "'I never,' said Mr. Bubble, "'see anything like a pitch has gotten to. "'The day before yesterday, a man, "'a man with hardly a rag on his back, "'here Mrs. Corney looked at the floor, "'goes to our overseer's door "'when he's got company coming for dinner "'and says he must be relieved, Mrs. Corney. "'As he wouldn't go away and shock the company very much, "'our overseer sent him out with a pound of potatoes "'and a half pint of oatmeal. 
"'My heart,' says the ungrateful villain. "'What's the use of this to me? "'You might as well give me a pair of iron spectacles.' "'Very good,' says our overseer, taking him away again. "'You won't get anything else here.' "'Then I'll die on the streets,' says the vagrant. "'Oh, no, you won't,' says the overseer. <laughs> "'That was very good. "'So like Mr. Gannett, wasn't it?' interposed the patron. "'Well, Mr. Bumble?' "'Well, ma'am,' rejoined the beetle. "'He went away and he did die in the streets. "'There's an obstinate pauper for you.' "'It beats anything I could have believed,' observed the matron emphatically. "'But don't you think out-of-door relief is a very bad thing anyway, Mr. Bumble? "'You're a gentleman of experience and ought to know. Come.' <laughs> Mrs. Corney, smiling as men smile who are conscious of superior information. Out of door relief, properly managed, properly managed, ma'am, is the parochial safeguard. The great principle of out of door relief is to give the paupers exactly what they don't want, and then they get tired of coming. Dear me, exclaimed Mrs. Corney. Well, that's a good one, too. Yes, betwixt you and me, ma'am, returned Mr. Bumble, that's the great principle. That's the reason why, if you look at any cases and get them audacious newspapers, you'll always observe that sick families have always been relieved with slices of cheese. That's the rule now, Mrs. Corney, all over the country. But however, said the beetle, stopping to unpack his bundle, these are official secrets, mum, not to be spoken of, except, as I may say, among the parochial officers such as ourselves. This is port wine, mum, that the board ordered for the infirmary, real, fresh, genuine port wine, only out of the cast this forenoon, clear as the bell, and no sediment. Having held the first bottle up to the light and shaken it well to test its excellence, Mr. Bumble placed them both on the top of a chest of drawers, folded the handkerchief in which they had been wrapped, put it carefully in his pocket, and took up his hat as if to go. "'You'll have a very cold walk, Mr. Bumble,' said the matron. "'It blows, madam,' replied Mr. Bumble, turning up his coat collar. "'Enough to cut one's ears off.' The matron looked from the little kettle to the beetle who was moving towards the door, and as the beetle coughed, preparatory to bidding her good night, bashfully inquired whether whether he could take a cup of tea. Mr. Bumble instantaneously turned back his collar again, laid his hat and stick upon the chair, and drew another chair up to the table. As he slowly seated himself, he looked at the lady. She fixed her eyes upon the little teapot. Mr. Bumble coughed again and slightly smiled. Mrs. Corney rose to get another cup and saucer from the closet. As she sat down, her eyes once again encountered those of the gallant beetle. She coloured, and applied herself to the task of making his tea. Again Mr. Bumble coughed, louder this time than he had coughed yet. "'Sweet, Mr. Bumble?' inquired the matron, taking up the sugar basin. "'Very sweet indeed, ma'am,' replied Mr. Bumble. He fixed his eyes on Mrs. Cornery as he said this, and if ever a beetle looked tender, Mr. Bumble was that beetle at that moment. The tea was made and handed in silence, Mr. Bumble, having spread a handkerchief over his knees to prevent the crumbs from sullying the splendour of his shorts, began to eat and drink, varying these amusements occasionally by fetching a deep sigh, which, however, had no injurious effect upon his appetite, but, on the contrary, rather seemed to facilitate the operations in the tea and toast department. "'You have a cat, ma'am, I see,' said Mr. Bumble, glancing at one who, in the centre of her family, was basking before the fire. "'And kittens, too, I declare.' "'I am so fond of them, Mr. Bumble, you can't think,' replied the matron. "'They're so happy, so frolicsome, and so cheerful that they are quite companions to me.' "'Very nice animals, Mum,' replied Mr. Bumble approvingly. "'So very domestic.' "'Oh, yes,' rejoined the matron with enthusiasm. "'So fond of their home, too. It's quite a pleasure, I'm sure.' "'Mrs. Corney, Mum,' said Mr. Bumble slowly and marking the time with his teaspoon, I mean to say this, mum, that any cat or kitten that could live with you, mum, and not be fond of his home must be an ass, ma'am. Oh, Mr. Bumble, remonstrated Mrs. Corney. It's of no use disguising the facts, ma'am, said Mr. Bumble, slowly flourishing his teaspoon with a kind of amorous dignity which made him doubly impressive. I would drown it myself with pleasure. Oh, you're a cruel man, said the matron vivaciously, as she held out her hand for the beetle's cup and a very hard-hearted man besides. Hard-hearted man, said Mr. Bumble. Hard? Mr. Bumble resigned his cup without another word, squeezed Mrs. Corney's little finger as she took it, and inflicting two open-handed slaps upon his laced waistcoat, gave a mighty sigh and hitched his chair a very little morsel farther from the fire. It was a round table, and as Mrs. Corney and Mr. Bumble had been sitting opposite each other, with no great space between them, 
and fronting the fire, it will be seen that Mr. Bumble, in receding from the fire and still keeping at the table, increased the distance between himself and Mrs. Corney, which proceeding, which some prudent readers will doubtless be disposed to admire and to consider an act of great heroism on Mr. Bumble's part, he being some sort tempted by time, place, and opportunity to give utterance to certain soft nothings which, however well they may become the lips of the light and thoughtless, do seem immeasurably beneath the dignity of judges of the land, members of parliament, ministers of state, lord mayors, and other great public functionaries, but more particularly beneath the stateliness and gravity of a beadle who, as it is well known, should be the sternest and most inflexible among them all. Whatever Mr. Bumble's intentions, however, and no doubt they were of the best, it unfortunately happened, as it had been twice before remarked, that the table was a round one. Consequently, Mr. Bumble, moving his chair little by little, soon began to diminish the distance between himself and matron, and, continuing to travel around the outer edge of the circle, brought his chair in time close to that in which the matron was seated. Indeed, the two chairs touched, and when they did so, Mr. Bumble stopped. Now, if the matron had moved her chair to the right, she would have been scorched by the fire, and if to the left, she must have fallen into Mr. Bumble's arms. So, being a discreet matron, and no doubt foreseeing the consequences at a glance, she remained where she was and had Mr. Bumble another cup of tea. "'Hard-hearted, Mrs. Corney,' said Mr. Bumble, stirring his tea and looking up into the matron's face. "'Are you hard-hearted, Mrs. Corney?' "'Dear me!' exclaimed the matron. "'What a very curious question from a single man. "'What can you want to know, Mr. Bumble?' "'The beadle drank his tea to the last drop, "'finished a piece of toast, "'whisked the crumbs off his knees, "'wiped his lips, and deliberately kissed the matron. "'Oh, Mr. Bumble!' cried that discreet lady in a whisper, "'for the fright was so great that she had quite lost her voice. "'Mr. Bumble, I should scream!' "'Mr. Bumble made no reply, but in a slow and dignified manner put his arm around the matron's waist. As the lady had stated her intention of screaming, of course she would have screamed at this additional boldness, but her exertion was rendered unnecessary by a hasty knocking at the door, which was no sooner heard than Mr. Bumble darted with much agility to the wine bottles and began dusting them with great violence, while the matron sharply demanded who was there. It is worthy of remark as the curious physical instance of the efficiency of a sudden surprise of contracting the elephants of extreme fear that a voice had quite recovered with all its official asperity. "'If you please, mistress,' said a withered old female pauper, hideously ugly, putting her head in the door. "'Old Sally is a-going fast.' "'Well, what's that to me?' angrily demanded the matron. "'I can't keep her alive, can I?' "'No, no, mistress,' replied the old woman. "'Nobody can.' She's far beyond the reach of help. I've seen a many people die, little babies and great strong men, and I know when deaths are coming well enough, but she's troubled in her mind, and when the fit's not on her, and that's not often for she's dying very hard, she says she has something to tell you, which you must hear. She'll never die quiet till you come, mistress. At this intelligence, the worthy Mrs. Corney muttered a variety of invectives against the old women who couldn't even die without purposely annoying their betters, and— Muffling herself in a thick shawl, which she hastily caught up, briefly requested Mr. Bumble to stay till she came back, lest anything particular should occur. Bidding the messenger walk fast and not be all night hobbling up the stairs, she followed her from the room with very ill grace, scolding all the way. Mr. Bumble's conduct on being left to himself was rather inexplicable. He opened the closet, counted the teaspoons, weighed the sugar tongs, closely inspected a silver milk pot to ascertain that it was of the genuine metal, and having satisfied his curiosity on these points, put on his cocked hat cornerwise and danced with much gravity four distinct times around the table. Having gone through this very extraordinary performance, he took off the cocked hat again and, spreading himself before the fire with his back towards it, seemed to be mentally engaged in taking an exact inventory of the furniture. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 Treats on a very poor subject but is a short one, and may be found of importance in this history. It was no unfit messenger of death who had disturbed the quiet of the matron's room. Her body was bent by age, her limbs trembled with palsy, her face, distorted into a mumbling leer, resembled more the grotesque shaping of some wild pencil than the work of nature's hand. Alas, how few of nature's faces are left alone to gladden us with their beauty! 
The cares and sorrows and hungerings of the world change them as they change hearts, and it is only when those passions sleep and have lost their hold forever that the troubled clouds pass off and leave heaven's surface clear. It is a common thing for the countenances of the dead, even in that fixed and rigid state, to subside into the long-forgotten expression of sleeping infancy, and settle into the very look of early life, so calm, so peaceful do they grow again, that those who knew them in their happy childhood kneel by the coffin side in awe, and see the angel even upon earth. The old crone tottered along the passages and up the stairs, muttering some indistinct answers to the chidings of her companion. Being at length compelled to pause for breath, she gave the light into her hand, and remained behind to follow as she might, while the more nimble superior made her way to the room where the sick woman lay. It was a bare garret room, with a dim light burning at the farther end. There was another old woman watching by the bed. The parish apothecary's apprentice was standing by the fire, making a toothpick out of a quill. "'Cold night, Mrs. Corney,' said this young gentleman, as the matron entered. "'Very cold indeed, sir.' replied the mistress in her most civil tones, and dropping a curtsy as she spoke. "'You should get better coals out of your contractors,' said the apothecary's deputy, breaking a lump on the top of the fire with the rusty poker. "'These are not at all the sort of thing for a cold night.' "'They're the board's choosing, sir,' returned the matron. "'The least they could do would be to keep us pretty warm, for our places are hard enough.' The conversation was here interrupted by a moan from the sick woman. "'Oh!' said the young man, turning his face toward the bed, as if he had previously quite forgotten the patient. "'It's all you pee there, Mrs. Corney.' "'Is it? Is it, sir?' asked the matron. "'If she lasts a couple of hours, I shall be surprised,' said the apothecary's apprentice, intent upon the toothpick's point. "'It's a break-up of the system altogether. Is she dozing, old lady?' The attendant stooped over the bed to ascertain, and nodded in the affirmative. "'Then perhaps she'll go off in that way if you don't make a row,' said the young man. "'Put the light on the floor. She won't see it there.' The attendant did as she was told, shaking her head, meanwhile, to intimate that the woman would not die so easily. Having done so, she resumed her seat by the side of the other nurse, who had by this time returned. The mistress, with an expression of impatience, wrapped herself in her shawl and sat at the foot of the bed. The apothecary's apprentice, having completed the manufacture of the toothpick, planted himself in front of the fire and made good use of it for ten minutes or so. When, apparently growing rather dull, he wished Mrs. Corney joy of her job and took himself off on tiptoe. When they had sat in silence for some time, the two old women rose from the bed and, crouching over the fire, held out their withered hands to catch the heat. The flame threw a ghastly light on their shriveled faces, and made their ugliness appear terrible, as, in this position, they began to converse in a low voice. "'Did she say any more, Annie dear, while I was gone?' inquired the messenger. "'Not a word,' replied the other. "'She plucked and tore at her arms for a little time, but I held her hands, and she soon dropped off. She hasn't much strength in her, so I easily kept her quiet. I ain't so weak for an old woman, though I am on parish allowance. No, no.' "'Did she drink the hot wine the doctor said she was to have?' demanded the first. "'I tried to get it down,' rejoined the other. "'But her teeth were tight-set, and she clenched the mug so hard that it was as much as I could do to get it back again. So I drank it, and it did me good.' Looking cautiously round, to ascertain that they were not overheard, the two hags cowered nearer to the fire and chuckled heartily. "'I mind the time,' said the first speaker, "'when she would have done the same, "'and made rare fun of it afterwards. "'Ay, that she would,' rejoined the other. "'She had a merry heart. "'A many, many beautiful corpses she laid out, "'as nice and neat as waxwork. "'My old eyes have seen them, "'ay, and these old hands touched them too. "'Ay, that she would,' rejoined the other. "'She had a merry heart. "'A many, many beautiful corpses she laid out, "'as nice and neat as waxwork.' My old eyes have seen them, ay, and those old hands touched them too, for I have helped her scores of times. Stretching forth her trembling fingers as she spoke, the old creature shook them exultingly before her face, and fumbling in her pocket, brought out an old time-discolored hin snuff-box, from which she shook a few grains into the outstretched palm of her companion, and a few more into her own. While they were thus employed, the matron, who had been impatiently watching until the dying woman should awaken from her stupor, joined them by the fire, and sharply asked how long she was to wait. 
"'Not long, mistress,' replied the second woman, looking up into her face. "'We have none of us long to wait for death. "'Patience, patience! He'll be here soon enough for us all.' "'Hold your tongue, you doting idiot,' said the matron sternly. "'You, Martha, tell me, has she been in this way before?' "'Often,' answered the first woman. "'But will never be again,' added the second one. "'That is, she'll never wake again but once. "'And mind, mistress, that won't be for long.' "'Long or short,' said the matron, snappishly, "'she won't find me here when she does wake. "'Take care, both of you, how you worry me again for nothing. "'It's no part of my duty to see all the old women in the house die, "'and I won't, that's more. "'Mind that, you impudent old harridans. "'If you make a fool of me again, I'll soon cure you, I warrant you.' "'She was bouncing away when a cry from the two women "'who had turned towards the bed caused her to look round. "'The patient had raised herself upright "'and was stretching her arms towards them. "'Who's that?' she cried in a hollow voice. "'Hush, hush,' said one of the women, stooping over her. "'Lie down, lie down.' "'I'll never lie down again alive,' said the woman, struggling. "'I will tell her. Come here, nearer. Let me whisper in your ear.' She clutched the matron by the arm, and forcing her into a chair by the bedside, was about to speak. When looking round, she caught sight of the two old women bending forward in the attitude of eager listeners. "'Turn them away,' said the woman, drowsily. "'Make haste! Make haste!' The two old crones, chiming in together, began pouring out many piteous lamentations that the poor dear was too far gone to know her best friends, and were uttering sundry protestations that they would never leave her, when the superior pushed them from the room, closed the door, and returned to the bedside. On being excluded, the old ladies changed their tone, and cried through the keyhole that old Sally was drunk— which, indeed, was not unlikely, since, in addition to a moderate dose of opium prescribed by the apothecary, she was laboring under the effects of a final taste of gin and water, which had been privily administered, in the openness of their hearts, by the worthy old ladies themselves. "'Now listen to me,' said the dying woman aloud, as if making a great effort to revive one latent spark of energy. "'In this very room,' In this very bed I once nursed a pretty young creature that was brought into the house with her feet cut and bruised with walking, and all soiled with dust and blood. She gave birth to a boy and died. Let me think. What was the year again? Never mind the year, said the impatient auditor. What about her? I, murmured the sick woman, relapsing into her former drowsy state. What about her? What about— I know— she cried, jumping fiercely up, her face flushed and her eyes starting from her head. I robbed her, so I did. She wasn't cold. I tell you, she wasn't cold when I stole it. Stole what, for God's sake? cried the matron, with a gesture as if she would call for help. It, replied the woman, laying her hand over the other's mouth. The only thing she had. She wanted clothes to keep her warm and food to eat, but she had kept it safe and had it in her bosom. It was gold, I tell you, rich gold that might have saved her life. Gold, echoed the matron, bending eagerly over the woman as she fell back. Go on, go on. Yes, what of it? Who was the mother? When was it? She charged me to keep it safe replied the woman with a groan, and trusted me as the only woman about her. I stole it in my heart when she first showed it me hanging round her neck, and the child's death perhaps is on me besides. They would have treated him better if they had known it all. Known what? asked the other. Speak. The boy grew so like his mother, said the woman, rambling on and not heeding the question, that I could never forget it when I saw his face. Poor girl, poor girl, she was so young, too, such a gentle lamb. Wait, there's more to tell. I have not told you all, have I? No, no, replied the matron, inclining her head to catch the words, as they came more faintly from the dying woman. Be quick, or it may be too late. The mother, said the woman, making a more violent effort than before. The mother... When the pains of death first came upon her, whispered in my ear that if her baby was born alive and thrived, the day might come when it would not feel so much disgraced to hear its poor young mother named. 
and oh kind heaven she said folding her thin hands together whether it be boy or girl raise up some friends for it in this troubled world and take pity upon a lonely desolate child abandoned to its mercy the boy's name demanded the matron they called him oliver replied the woman feebly the gold i stole was yes yes what cried the other she was bending eagerly over the woman to hear her reply, but drew back instinctively as she once again rose, slowly and stiffly, into a sitting posture, then, clutching the coverlid with both hands, muttered some indistinct sounds in her throat and fell lifeless on the bed. "'Stone dead,' said one of the old women, hurrying in as soon as the door was open. "'And nothing to tell after all,' rejoined the matron, walking carelessly away. The two crones, to all appearance, too busily occupied in the preparations for their dreadful duties to make any reply, were left alone, hovering about the body. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 Wherein this history reverts to Mr. Fagan and company. While these things were passing in the country workhouse, Mr. Fagan sat in the old den, the same from which Oliver had been removed by the girl, brooding over a dull, smoky fire. He held a pair of bellows upon his knee, which he had apparently been endeavouring to rouse it into more cheerful action, but had fallen into deep thought when, with his arms folded on them, and his chin resting on his thumbs, fixed his eyes abstractedly on the rusty bars. At the table behind him sat the artful dodger, Master Charles Bates, and Mr. Chitling, all intent upon a game of whist, the artful taking dummy against Master Bates and Mr. Chitling. The countenance of the first-named gentleman, peculiarly intelligent at all times, acquired great additional interest from his close observance of the game and his attentive perusal of Mr. Chitling's hand, upon which from time to time as occasion served, he bestowed a variety of earnest glances, wisely regulating his own play as the result of his observations upon his neighbor's cards. It being a cold night, the Dodger wore his hat as, indeed, was often his custom within doors. He also sustained a clay pipe between his teeth, which he only removed for a brief space when he deemed it necessary to apply for refreshment to a quart pot upon the table, which stood ready filled with gin and water for the accommodation of the company. Master Bates was also attentive to the play, but being of a more excitable nature than his accomplished friend, it was observable that he more frequently applied himself to the gin and water, and moreover indulged in many jests and irrelevant remarks, all highly unbecoming a scientific rubber. Indeed, the artful, presuming upon their close attachment, more than once took occasion to reason gravely with his companion upon those improprieties, all of which remonstrances Master Bates received in extremely good part merely requesting his friend to be blowed, or to insert his head in a sack, or replying with some other neatly turned witticism of a similar kind, the happy application of which excited considerable admiration in the mind of Mr. Chipping. It was remarkable that the latter gentleman and his partner invariably lost, and that the circumstance, so far from angering Master Bates, appeared to afford him the highest amusement inasmuch as he laughed most uproariously at the end of every deal, and protested that he had never seen such a jolly game in all his born days. "'As two doubles in the rub,' said Mr. Chipping, with a very long face, as he drew half a crown from his waistcoat pocket. "'I never seen such a fellow as you, Jack. You win everything. Even when we've good cause, Charlie and I can't make nothing of them. Either the master, or the manner of his remark, which was made very ruefully, delighted Charlie Bates so much that his consequent shout of laughter roused the Jew from his reverie, and induced him to inquire what was the matter. "'Master Fagin!' cried Charlie. "'I wish you'd watch the play. Tommy Chitling hadn't won a point, and I went partners with him against the artful and dumb.' "'Aye, aye,' said the Jew, with a grin which sufficiently demonstrated that he was at no loss to understand the reason. "'Try him again, Tom. Try him again.' "'No more of it for me, thank you, Fagin,' replied Mr. Chitling. "'I've had enough. "'That here dodger has such a run of luck there's no standing to get him.' "'Ha, <laughs> my dear,' replied the Jew. "'You must get up very early in the morning to win against the dodger.' "'Morning,' said Charlie Bates. "'You must put your boots on overnight and have a telescope at each eye "'and an opera glass between your shoulders if you want to come over him.' Mr. Dawkins received these handsome compliments with much philosophy, and offered to cut any gentleman in company for the first picture card at a shilling at a time. Nobody accepting the challenge, and his pipe being by this time smoked out, he proceeded to amuse himself by sketching a brown plan of Newgate on the table with a piece of chalk, which had served him in lieu of counters, whistling meantime with peculiar shrillness. 
How precious dull you are, Tommy, said the Dodger, stopping short when there had been a long silence, and addressing Mr. Chipping. What do you think he's thinking of, Fagin? How should I know, my dear, replied the Jew, looking round as he plied his bellows. About his losses, maybe, or his little retirement in the country that he just left, eh? <laughs> Is that it, my dear? Not a bit of it, replied the Dodger, stopping the subject of discourse as Mr. Chipping was about to reply. What do you say, Charlie? I should say, replied Master Bates with a grin, that he was uncommon sweet upon Betsy. See how he's a blushing Oh my eye, there's a merry-go-rounder. Tommy Chitlin's in love. Oh, Fagin, Fagin, what a spree! Thoroughly overpowered with the notion, Mr. Chipping being the victim of the tender passion, Master Bates threw himself back on his chair with such violence that he lost his balance, and pitched over to the floor where, the accident debating nothing of his merriment, he lay at full length until his laugh was over, when he resumed his former position and began another laugh. "'Never mind, my dear,' said the Jew, winking at Mr. Dawkins and giving Master Bates a reproving tap with the nozzle from his bellows. Betsy's a fine girl. Stick up to her, Tom. Stick up to her. What I meant to say, Fagin, replied Mr. Chitman, very red in the face, is that there isn't anything to anybody here. No more it is, replied the Jew. Charlie will talk. Don't mind him, my dear. Don't mind him. Betsy's a fine girl. Do as she bids you, Tom, and you'll make your fortune. So I do do as she bids me, replied Mr. Chitman. I shouldn't have been milled if I hadn't been for her advice. But it turned out a good job for you, didn't it, Fagin? And what's six weeks of it? It must come some time or another, and why not in the winter time when you don't want to go out a walking so much, eh, Fagin? Ah, to be sure, my dear, replied the Jew. You wouldn't mind again, Tom, would you? asked the Dodger, winking upon Charlie and the Jew. If that was all right? I mean to say that I shouldn't, replied Tom angrily. There now, uh, who'll say as much as that? I would like to know, eh, Fagin? "'Nobody, my dear,' replied the Jew. "'Not a soul, Tom. "'I don't know one of them that would do it besides you. "'Not one of them, my dear.' "'I might have got clear off if I'd spit upon him, mightn't I, Fagin?' "'Angrily pursued the poor half-witted Duke. "'A word to me would have done it, wouldn't it, Fagin?' "'Oh, to be sure it would, my dear,' replied the Jew. "'But I didn't blab it, did I, Fagin?' demanded Tom, "'pouring question upon question with great mobility. "'No, no, to be sure,' replied the Jew. You were too stout-hearted for that, a deal too stout, my dear. Perhaps I was, rejoined Tom, looking around. And if I was, was to laugh at it, eh, Fagin? The Jew, perceiving that Mr. Chipping was considerably roused, hastened to assure them that nobody was laughing, and to prove the gravity of the company appealed to Master Bates, the principal offender. But unfortunately Charlie, in opening his mouth to reply that he was never more serious in his life, was unable to prevent the escape of such a violent roar that the abused Mr. Chipney, without any preliminary ceremonies, rushed across the room and aimed a blow at the offender, who, being skilful in evading pursuit, ducked to avoid it and chose his time so well that it lighted upon the chest of the merry old gentleman and caused him to stagger into the wall, where he stood panting for breath while Mr. Chipney looked in intense dismay. Hark! cried the Dodger at this moment. I heard the tinkler, catching up the light, crept softly upstairs. The bell was rung again with some impatience, while the party was in darkness. After a short pause, the Dodger appeared, and whispered Fagin mysteriously. What? cried the Jew. Alone? The Dodger nodded in the affirmative, and, shading the flame of the candle with his hand, gave Charlie Bates a private intonation in dumb show that he had better not be funny just then. Having performed this friendly office, he fixed his eyes on the Jew's face and awaited his directions. The old man bit his yellow fingers, and meditated for some seconds, his face working with agitation the while, as if he dreaded something and feared to know the worst. At length he raised his head. "'Where is he?' he asked. The Dodger pointed to the floor above and made a gesture as if to leave the room. "'Yes,' said the Jew, answering the mute inquiry. "'Bring him down. Hush, quiet, Charlie. Chitnik, Tom. Scare, scarce.' This brief direction to Charlie Bates and his recent antagonist was softly and immediately obeyed. There was no sound of their whereabout when the doctor descended the stairs bearing the light in his hand, and followed by a man in a coarse smock-frock who, after casting a hurried glance around the room, pulled off a large wrapper which had concealed the lower portion of his face and disclosed all haggard, unwashed, and unshorn the features of Flash Toby Crackett. 
How are you, Fagery? said his worthy, nodding to the Jew. Pop that shawl away in me caster, Dodger, so I may know where I can find it when I cut it's the time of day. You'll be a fine young cracksman of forty old file now. With these words he pulled up the smock frock, and, winding it around his middle, drew a chair to the fire and placed his feet upon the hob. See here, Faggy, he said, pointing disconsolately to his top boots. Not a drop of day in Martin since you know when, not a bubble of black in by Jove. But don't look at me that way, man, all in good time. I can't talk about business till I've eaten drinks, so produce the substance, and let's have a quiet fit out for the first time these three days. The Jew motioned to the Dodger to place what eatables there were upon the table, and, seating himself opposite the housebreaker, waited his leisure. To judge from appearances, Toby was by no means in a hurry to open the conversation. At first, the Jew contented himself with patiently watching his countenance, as if to gain from its expression some clue to the intelligence he brought, but in vain. He was tired and worn, but there was always some complacent repose upon his features that they always wore, and through dirt and beard and whisker there still shone unimpaired the self-satisfied smirk of flash Toby Crackett. Then the Jew, with agony of impatience, watched every morsel he put in his mouth, pacing up and down the room, meanwhile, in irrepressible excitement. It was all no use. Toby continued to eat with the utmost outward indifference until he could eat no more. Then, ordering the dodger out, he closed the door, mixed a glass of spirits and water, and composed himself for talking. First and foremost, Fagri, said Toby. Yes, yes, interposed the Jew, drawing up his chair. Mr. Crackett stopped to take a draught of spirits and water, and declared the gin was excellent. Then, placing his feet against the low mantelpiece so as to bring his boots to about the level of his eye, he quietly resumed. First and foremost, Fagri, said the housebreaker. As Bill. What? screamed the Jew, staring from his seat. Oh, you don't mean to say, began Toby, turning pale. Mean? cried the Jew, stamping his foot furiously on the ground. Where are they? Sykes and the boy. Where are they? Where have they been? Where are they hiding? Why have they not been here? The quick failed, said Toby faintly. I know it, replied the Jew, tearing a newspaper from his pocket and pointing to it. What more? They fired and hit the boy. We cut over fields at the back with him between us, straight as a crow flies through edge and ditch. They gave chase. Damn, the whole country was awake and the dogs upon us. The boy! Bill had him on his back and he scudded like the wind. We stopped to take him between us, his head dung down and he was cold. They were close upon our heels, every man for himself, and each for the gallows. We parted company and left the young Ceylon in a ditch. Alive or dead, that's all I know about him. The Jew stopped to hear no more, but uttering a loud yell, and twining his hands in his hair, rushed from the room and from the house. End of chapter 25